I know, I'm sad too. Have you guys had a great Bible school? Let me know. Yes or no? Yeah. I have to. Okay. Um, we are going to recognize a few people, very important people tonight, because we are not going to have everyone at church on Sunday because we have some people going on vacation. Um, we want to first recognize our craft ladies. Can you stand up if you did the crafts? Are they not in here? <laughs> okay, our sound booth crew. Can you stand up and let everybody recognize? Our music crew. Yeah. Our skit crew. Yeah. Our bus crew. Yeah. Our team building crew. Our games crew. Our food crew. Are they up yet? Best ice cream in town, right? And our security crew that's outside. Okay, it wouldn't be possible without all of you teachers, so I'm going to have you stand up. I know, but it would not be possible without you. Our baby, stand up. Everybody, give them a round of applause. Yes, clap for them. Thank you guys, really, honestly. We, we couldn't have VBS without you. Um, now we're going to have um, our outreach lady come out, Miss Lee. Hello. What about our directors? <laughs> um, I just want to say real quick, because we have had a whole bunch of visitors, visitor kids and visitor mom and dad. So you're not a visitor anymore because now you've been with us all week, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have cards and fans that we're going to pass out that has our number on it. So if you decide that you and your mom and dad want to come to church on Sunday mornings for Sunday school or on Wednesday nights when we start back or revival or car show or ladies night out or all the good stuff we've got going and we're talking about a real fun back to school kickoff again at the end of the summer, okay? Y'all listening? Yeah. What'd I say? Okay, so we're going to hand these out as y'all are leaving, I think, maybe. Um, that way, when your parents come to get you, they'll be able to get it and take it home with them. But just be sure and tell your moms that y'all want to come back, okay? Can you do that? Okay. Thank you, Miss Lee. Okay, uh, we are Gary, will you um, pray for us, please? Come up here. Uh, everyone, please bow your heads. Uh, Lord, thank you for this this week that we've had here uh, at Friendship Church and, and the the good times and the fellowship that we've had together and uh, and all uh, learning about you, Lord. And um, if you would, please be with this service that we have tonight. And uh, if uh, anybody out here is, is feeling lost and has that feeling in their heart, Lord, I pray that they would make that move to, uh, to accept you, Lord. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Gary. All right, let's have our babies come up and our uh, music team.
can you help me do the pledges? Yes. Where's Miss Brenda? <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to do the pledges. We're going to do the American flag first. Attention, salute, pledge.
Yeah. Okay, can I have our uh, nursery and our three through pre-K stand up? And you guys are going to go out. Okay, guys, we have a very special treat for you. Uh, Mr. John Clark is going to come up, and he is going to give us his testimony. Hey, everybody. So, uh, Brooke asked me uh, if I would share my testimony, and... Um, for those that don't know me, I am one, I'm a kid. I grew up who grew up in church. I grew up in church, um, and uh, I've been going to church pretty much all my life. Uh, my dad's a pastor. He's pastored at different churches, and so I grew up going to church, and I grew up knowing about Jesus, and I grew up knowing that he loves me and uh, that he, you know, he is the Savior and all that. But the thing is... There came a point in my life when I was about 11 years old, and I was at a VBS, not at this church, but I was at my grandparents' church at Harmony Grove Baptist Church, and it was a Wednesday night, and they had a service much like this one, where the preacher came and he preached a message, and it was that night that I realized that it didn't matter how much I had gone to church, or even the fact that I knew I had knowledge about Jesus. There was something more that was missing. That night, I realized I was lost. I needed Him as my Savior. I needed to be rescued by Him. And I remember what the preacher preached about that night. He preached about the Egyptians and the plagues that came on the Egyptians and the darkness that fell on Egypt and how the Egyptians felt that darkness. And that's when I realized I needed Him. I needed Jesus as my Savior. Didn't matter how much I'd been to church. Didn't matter the fact if I knew my Bible or not. I needed Him as my Savior. I didn't have that relationship with Him. You see, we all need a relationship with Him because as we've learned about this week, that's that relationship way back that Adam and Eve had, it was separated when they sinned against God, when they disobeyed. It was broken. But God made a plan. He made a plan through His Son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us and took the death penalty that was our penalty. And He rose again and because of that, because he was the son of God, and he is the son of God, and he came down and died and rose again, he defeated death. And he made a way for us to be reconciled or made right, that, rest, that, um, that relationship restored. So I didn't go up that night to the altar during the service. I didn't go up. I was a pretty shy kid when I was little. I didn't go up. But I realized if I didn't do something, if I didn't do something, I couldn't stand it anymore. And that'd be it. And so I got home that night. My grandparents, which are sitting right back there, they dropped me and my brother off that night. I went up to my room, I got ready for bed as usual, and I couldn't, I couldn't hold, I couldn't stand it any longer. And my mom came into my room, and I told her, Mom, I'm lost. And she looked at me and she said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And so we started praying right there in my bedroom. And the only thing that I remember praying is, Lord, please save me. 
And right after that, that feeling that I had was gone. And I realized I had him as my savior. I had been saved. He was living in me through his Holy Spirit. He lived in me. And I had been rescued. And I was so excited and so happy. And my dad came into the room and we were all crying and we were all happy. And I just, I wanted to tell everybody what Jesus had done for me. I called up everybody I knew, all my family members. I didn't care if it was the middle of the night. It was probably, I don't know, maybe 10 o'clock by then. Most people were already in bed. I was waking some people up. But I didn't care. I needed to tell people about what Jesus had done for me. He had saved me. And ever since then, he has never left me. The older that I have gotten, I have gone, I have lived through, you know, a lot. I've gone through school. I've graduated. I have a beautiful wife that the Lord has blessed me with now and two girls. And the Lord has never left me, no matter what. No matter where I've gone, what I've done, he has never, ever left me. And the more, I, the older I get, the more I realize that that's a security that you can count on. That is true security. That is true hope. Because he will never leave. He will never forsake. He will never let you down. No matter what happens in your life. He will never leave. And that's good news to share. Ladies and gentlemen, that's good news to share. So I pray tonight, if there is somebody here who doesn't have that relationship, and they're sitting there thinking, you know, what do I do? What is this feeling? I pray you come and you pray. And I know there will be ones here who will come and pray with you. And you'll get to know the Savior that I know. And you'll get to have that relationship with Him.
sitting there shaking his hand, writing you off, leaving you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his hand, wishing he never went to that cross. He's not sitting there shaking his hand, writing you off, leaving you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his hand. can get this thing out here without tearing any more vines down. Good evening. I know because I've been here every night that um, <clears throat> y'all had a good time at Vacation Bible School, haven't you? Yeah. I think from the, from the young ones all the way up to the, us older folks, uh, we've all had a good time <clears throat> in Vacation Bible School. And I want to mention... Um, Brooke got up here, I know, and recognized all of the ones that has been working this week. And uh, But I want to recognize Brooke and, and Chelsea for what they have done. Uh, it's been very obvious that they've been excited about this week. I know both of them is tired, but uh, we do appreciate them. And let's let them know by giving them a round of applause. <clears throat> Very thankful, very blessed to have all of you, uh, to have had all of you all week. I'm glad that you came back tonight, and uh, I want to uh, go ahead and apologize a little bit to the middle school and high school age, because some of what I say tonight, you might have heard when I spoke to you during team building last night, so I hope you'll forgive me uh, if I repeat some of the stuff to you that you've already heard, but uh, I want to try my best to follow the Lord of all the preaching that I do all year long on Sundays and sometimes in revivals and, and uh, opportunities that God gives me to preach. This is the one service that always really, really gets me. <clears throat> because in this service, I want to make sure that I make the gospel as plain and as clear and as simple as I possibly can. I know some of you in here are still very young. You're probably still too young to really understand and recognize uh, much of what I say. But some of you uh, are already beginning to, to ask questions. Uh, you're already beginning to understand some things. And uh, you're already beginning to realize that in the eyes of God, uh, you're not perfect. In the eyes of God, we have all sinned. We've all messed up. And if I could share something with you that I think you'll understand, most all of you have seen a target. You know what a target is. It's got a big red bullseye right in the center, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can either shoot a bow and arrow at it or, or something, but that's God's standard. I want you to think of that as God's standard, that bullseye. And, and God's standard is perfection. He wants us to hit the bullseye. And the fact is, none of us can. Not in our lives, not with what we do, not our actions, because the Bible's very clear. And Paul states in his book in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, he says this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that throws every one of us in the same boat. Every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Where did it all start? 
Y'all remember at the beginning of the week when we did the skit with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were the first two people that God created. He made Adam from the dust of the ground, from the dirt, as our skit said. And he caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he took a rib from Adam's side. And he made a woman and brought her to be with Adam. And they too uh, were together there in a, in a perfect paradise, in a place called Eden. And God gave them all the trees, all, everything they could have possibly wanted was right there in that one place. And all they had to do was obey God. All they had to do was what God said, and all would be well. But guess what? The devil, Satan, came on the scene, and there was a tree that God had gave specific instructions. He had told them, do not eat from this tree. It was a tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, you can eat from every other tree here. Just leave that tree alone. Don't eat from it. And so you could say it like this. God gave them one no-no. One. That's it. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And guess what? When Satan tempted Adam and Eve, they took from that tree and they ate of it and they became sinners in the eyes of God. They missed the bullseye. They were no longer under God's standard of perfection. They had sinned. They had messed up. And ever since that day, every one of us that's ever been born from there on, from there forward, we have all been guilty of committing sin. We have all been guilty of doing wrong. Not a one of us is perfect. Not a one of us can look at another and say, well, I'm better than you are. Because in, in, by God's standard, we've all sinned. We've all come short of his glory. We've all messed up. But God loves us so much. God loves us so much that he had a plan. He had a plan for man's disobedience. He had a plan because he loves us that much. He wanted to have a relationship with us. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you have to have all the best that he has to offer. And even though we can't see Jesus with our eyes, I mean, we all see pictures and paintings and stuff like that, but really none of us know exactly what he looks, at, looks like because we've never actually seen Jesus with our eyes here on this earth. But we believe that he lives. We believe that he's alive because God sent him to this world for my sin and for your sin because he knew we couldn't meet his standard of perfection. He knew we would never be able to hit the bullseye. He knew that we were sinners and that without hope, without something to forgive us of our sin, we would be lost forever and there would be no eternity with him. And so in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of John, uh, in chapter 3, there are these verses. And that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is probably, the next verse is probably one of the most popular verses in all of Scripture. If anyone knows a, a verse in the Bible, it's probably this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Did you hear what Jesus said? These are the words of Jesus. And he said, God sent his Son into the world that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now we all know and you all know because I'm sure most everybody in this church tonight has, has had someone that you love, someone that you cared about and they've passed away, they've died. Because the Bible is very clear that because of sin, death came into the world. And so death is very much a part of life. And so from time to time, maybe it's a grandparent, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's just a good friend, someone that you know, someone that you love. So we know that death is a very real thing. So when Jesus says here that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, he's not talking about a natural death. We're all going to face that one day. But he's talking about an everlasting life. He's talking about a place where we'll never grow old, a place where we'll never be sick, a place where disease will never come, a place where we'll live with him forever and forever. Everlasting life. That place is called heaven. 
And he's gone to prepare that place and still prepares that place because he, he and here's the good thing about that. There's room for whoever wants to go. There's room for everybody that wants to go. And he leaves the choice to us. Notice it says he did not come into the world to condemn the world. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come to condemn us? Aren't you glad he didn't come to point fingers and say, Oh, you missed the mark. You didn't hit the bullseye. You missed God's perfect standard. You've sinned and so you're doomed. There's no way you can ever go to heaven. No, he didn't say that. It says he didn't come to condemn, but he came that the world through him might be saved. He came to save us. Isn't that good news? He came to give us hope. He came to give us eternal life. And listen, here's the good news. He that believes on him is not condemned. I'm glad that ever since when I was a little boy at Coal Mountain Baptist Church, I went to an altar, as John Clark testified earlier. He made his altar beside his bed there at home, and I remember that night very well. But myself, I went to an altar in Coal Mountain Baptist Church. I went when the invitation was given, and I got on my knees, and I don't even remember the words that I prayed, but I know that I asked Jesus to save me, and he did. He saved me. He gave me eternal life. And since that time, I've never, he promised I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And he's never left me, he's never forsaken me, he's been with me from that day forward. But listen to what else he says. But he that believes not is condemned already. Those that believe not are already under condemnation. And here's why. Because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. They've never believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the Bible said, Jesus said, they're already under condemnation. Does it have to stay that way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It, you don't have to stay under that condemnation. You can become a believer in Christ. And then you too will be in. Remember the skip from last night? Noah built the ark for the saving of his family. Well, if you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, guess what? It's just like getting on that ark. You'll be in the ark of safety because you'll be uh, in Jesus Christ. You'll have him as your Savior. And you'll never have to worry about uh, uh, when your time comes, you'll never have to worry about, will God be with me? Is he going to turn his back on me? No, he'll always be there. Whatever your situation is, whatever you face in life, he will always be there for you. So who needs to be saved? As I said, everybody. Paul said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. We've all messed up. But here's more good news. Paul also says in that same book, in Romans 6, verse 23, listen to what he says. For the wages of sin, the payment for sin, is death. Okay? Remember, Adam and Eve, because they sinned in the garden, death came to them eventually. So the wages of sin is death. But listen, it doesn't end there. Paul goes on and says, the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift that God gives us is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And guess what? The, 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 the unique thing about a gift is this. A gift is not a gift until it's received. If someone offers you a gift and you refuse to take it, it's not a gift. But it's a gift once you take it because they're giving you that gift. They want you to have it. They want you to take it. And that's what God offers anybody that wants it. He offers them the gift of salvation. And if you'll take that gift and receive it and believe in him, he will save you. There is no doubt. I know that because Paul also says in Romans chapter 10, listen to these words. Paul says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So we believe in the heart, and then we confess that Jesus is our Savior with our mouth. We want others to know that. The Scripture says, Whosoever believes in him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between Jew and Greek. We're all in this together. We've all sinned. We've all messed up. We all need a Savior. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here he says it again in verse 13. 
For whosoever, that's everybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever chooses to call on him, whosoever believes shall be saved. Isn't that good news? Paul also in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, listen to these verses. Paul says, for by grace, remember we mentioned grace in one of the skits, grace is God's unmerited, undeserved favor. It's something he gives us even though we don't deserve it, okay? I bet you there's not a child in this room that's old enough to to, to, to know, and, and maybe mom and dad has told you to do something and you disobeyed them, you didn't do what they said, did mom and dad quit loving you? Absolutely not. Were they disappointed? Absolutely sure they were. But I guarantee you they showed you grace. I guarantee you they showed you grace. You didn't deserve it, but they just kept loving you anyway. That's what God does for us. That's what he did for us when he sent Jesus into this world. Even when we were dead in sins, he says, God made us alive together with Christ. Because by grace, we are saved. By the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. Not of works. Did you hear that? We're not saved by works. We're not saved because we come to vacation Bible school every night. We're not saved because we come to church every Sunday morning. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor. I'm saved by God's grace because I have faith in Him. I believe that He died on the cross and shed His blood, and that blood covers my sins. I believe that He rose again on the third day, and that's why we celebrate Easter. And I believe that He ascended back to the Father, and He's alive in heaven, and He intercedes on my behalf every day. And when I pray and ask forgiveness of sin, it's still through the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross that I'm forgiven of my sins. Remember the skins that Adam and Eve had on, those coats of skins? Remember that? God made those. What had to happen for those skins to be made? The animal's blood had to be shed. So the blood of Jesus had to be shed for my sins to be covered. Isn't that good? And he did it for us. Now listen to verse 10 because this is important. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. When you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I read one time there's one interpretation that says it's almost as if the Bible says that we're God's poetry. We're a work of art. His masterpiece. And he, do, he does that for us because we then are to go out and do good works. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. And those good works include serving him. You middle school and high schoolers remember last night we talked about church membership. I believe that's what he wants out of every one of us. He saves us and he wants us to unite with a God-fearing, Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. And not just put so we can have our name on a church membership, but to be an active, functioning member of the body of Christ. Because once you're saved, that's exactly what you become. You become a member of the body of Christ. And that is awesome, awesome news. So who, who, who has sinned? Everybody has sinned. We've all messed up. Everybody. We've all come short of the glory of God. Who needs to be saved? Every one of us need to be saved. How does it happen? By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, by accepting Jesus as your Savior. That's how it happens. And I promise you this, I have yet to ever, and I've been pastoring for 30-something years, and I have never had anyone come to me and say, well, Pastor, I really wish I had never got saved. <laughs> I've never had anyone tell me that. As a matter of fact, the older we get, it seems like the sweeter it begins to grow because it becomes more real each and every day. And the older you get, trust me, the older you get, the more special it will become. And so my invitation to you is this. Uh, I, you, you've learned this week, you've learned about uh, Adam and Eve and their sin in the garden. You've learned about... God's purpose for Adam and Eve, he wanted a relationship with them. He created them to have relationship, yet they sinned against him. They tried to cover their sin by themselves using the fig leaves. That didn't work out so well. They were afraid. They hid themselves from God. They'd never been afraid of him before. And yet God still loved Adam and Eve. 
And so he made them coats of skin, put it on them to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin, and to restore a relationship with his created people. And the time came when he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you can have that as well. You can be saved. You can, and let me tell you something. The Bible talks about, um, uh, in one place, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You'll never have a better friend. Because here's the neat thing about knowing Jesus Christ. You may, it may seem that you're all alone, but you're never alone. When Noah and his family, when they got off of that ark, it was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. So there were eight individuals got off of that ark. And you say, my, what a lonely, lonely place that must have been. But you know what? They were never alone because God was with them. He was on them on the ark. He was on them when they got, uh, with them when they got on, off the ark. He was there. And that's how it'll be with you. It may seem some of the loneliest times in your life, and yet he will be there because he loves you that much. There's only so much that, that this world can offer you. But I'll guarantee you this, it'll never be able to offer you the peace and the joy that God can give you through belief in his son, Jesus Christ. And nothing, nothing can ever take that away. I put it this way, and I noticed down on the wall in the, in the fellowship building, there was a, a poster that was put up there. And, and I talk about the ABCs all the time. Anybody see that poster down there? The ABCs. And I say it's admit. Admit what? Admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you're lost. Admit that you can't save yourself. And then believe that Jesus Christ came to this world for the sole purpose of living a perfect, sinless life so that he could die on a cross in your behalf and in my behalf. And if the world goes on another thousand years, in their behalf as well. Shed his blood, his perfect, sinless blood, so that you and I could be saved. So that you and I could have hope in a hopeless world. And then the C part is, is choose to believe. I believe is what it says on there. But I always say this about the C. It's to confess. We admit, we believe, and then we confess that Jesus Christ. We choose to confess him as our Lord and Savior of our life. And here's the neat thing. It really isn't that God chooses us. I mean that we choose God. It really isn't that. It's that he chooses us. Isn't that amazing? Because if it were up to us to choose him, really, when it comes right down to it, we'd probably never make the choice. But he chooses us. He draws us to himself through his Holy Spirit. And then we just have to believe. Just believe. The Bible says, what did Paul say? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen shall be saved. And there's a lot of you in this church tonight, I know, because I've heard your testimony. I've heard you tell, tell me, you've talked about when the Lord saved you, whether it was in a Bible school, whether it was in a Sunday morning worship service, whether it was at home beside your bed, uh, wherever it was, you've told me about when the Lord saved you, and that's awesome. But If you don't have that testimony and you feel that tug in your heart, you can have it. He will save you in this place tonight. And I'll make it easy. I'll invite you to come. I mean, I know we've got all of this um, green greenery here up here, but it doesn't matter. You can still bow. I've seen a lot of people bow right here in this place and pray and ask Jesus to save them. I've seen it. I've seen them shed tears of grief because of their sin. I've seen it happen. And then I've seen the, the, the tears turn into to great smiles and, and just joy on their face and then there were still some tears sometimes but it wasn't tears of sadness anymore it was tears of joy because they had accepted and believed in Jesus as their savior and been gloriously saved by his marvelous grace but you don't have to come up here if you if you if you're embarrassed about coming up in front of a bunch of people that's okay you can be saved right, right there where you are if you've got a teacher that you've put your trust in this week and you've sat and you've listened to them teach and you've been with them all this week and, 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 and you know that they would pray for you, go and ask your teacher. I don't know of a one of them this week or, or, or the, 
If it's someone in the kitchen that you've gotten close to, maybe in the crowds, maybe down at the games, there's not a one of them, if you'll go to them, that wouldn't come to this altar with you and pray. But here's what it comes down to. You have to ask yourself. I, can't, I can pray on your behalf, but I can't save you. I can pray on your behalf, but I can't pray that prayer for you to ask you. You know, you've got to pray that prayer yourself and admit to God that you're lost and believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and that he rose again. And then be, be willing to confess that Jesus has saved your soul. And if you'll do that, he will. He will save you. We got someone to... to good deal. You singing? Would you stand up, please? his death paid the price for your sin and my sin he did that for you and he did it for me and I've never known him to turn one away if you'll just believe that's what it's all about 
Just believe it. This is a, a very, very serious time. A very serious time. People make decisions that have eternal consequences. This isn't just something about today or tomorrow. This is eternal consequences we're talking about. Forever. And Christ can make a difference. Christ can make a difference. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good.
she has come this way, Lord, because she wants you to save her. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would just put peace in her little heart, Lord. Take, Lord, any fear away and give her joy, Lord, and let her know, God, that everything's okay. We ask you, God, because we believe with all of our hearts, Lord, that you came to seek and to save those that are lost. You came, God, for this very reason, Lord, so that little boys and girls, men and women, God, would bow their heads and believe, Lord, in you. They would accept, Lord, the blood that you shed on the cross for their sins. And they would believe, Lord, that you rose again on the third day. And, God, that you're there in heaven, Lord, and you want us to come and be with you. And so, God, we pray that you would save her right now, Lord. Take any doubt away, God, and give her joy in her little heart. Let her know, God, that everything's okay. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it all. In Jesus' precious holy name. chair that waits for you and a friend who understands everything you're going through he goes to my of course he does of course he does but you keep standing at a distance in the shadows of your shame. Huh? There's a light of hope that shines. Won't you come and take your place? Bring it all to the table. It's nothing here.
Savior if you got chains. He's a chain breaker. He's a prison shaking Savior if you got chains. He's a chain.
tell me tonight that they accepted Christ as their Savior, that Jesus had saved them. Uh, <clears throat> if you're one of those, would you come up here with me? There's nothing better than you. <laughs> Amen. 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 But, you know, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. That's what Ethan Fields just came and hugged my neck, and that was the very words he said. God is good, and he's good all the time. Here's what I know. God knows. I think sometimes I know, but I don't know anything. But God knows. Amen? Amen. God knows. <clears throat> I may not know every name up here, and if I do, I may get them wrong sometimes. But that's okay, because I promise you, when that name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, God never forgets it. Amen? Amen. Never forgets it. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's been good tonight, hasn't it? Amen. It's been good. And I'm so thankful. <clears throat> I believe I could preach. I believe I could. I want all of you to know the decision that you made tonight to accept Christ as your Savior is one that will never be taken away from you. The greatest decision that you've ever, ever made, you've made here tonight to believe and accept Jesus Christ. Some of you know, some of you might have been in the middle school class, some of you might have been in the high school class, but this is what I, this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to say. Jesus saved you, but he saved you for a reason. He saved you because he wanted a relationship with you. And you know how you serve him? You find you a church somewhere. If friendship's a church where you go, this is a great place. If it's another church where you go to serve him, whatever you do, stay in a Christ-centered, Bible-believing church where they lift up the name of Jesus, that you must be born again, you must be saved. And God will use you and the Holy Spirit will direct your life and he will lead and guide and direct you. Some of you will teach one day. Some of you will. You may be teachers and God's going to use you in big ways. So I want you to understand something tonight. You get saved and that's just the beginning because God wants to bless you and he wants to use you and, and, and he will if you will allow him to. You took that first step and Jesus was right there, wasn't he? 
He was right there. And he promised that he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. So I love you tonight, every one of you, but I want you to know something. Jesus loves you so much more. Amen. So much more. And church, look at this. What a responsibility. Amen. What a responsibility. The Lord saved them, and oftentimes we're dissatisfied with that. But now we need to come along beside them and help them grow in that relationship. I was eight years old when I got saved. I was very young. I didn't understand a whole lot about it. And I'll be quite honest with you. I went back to the altar at, uh, at other times as I got older and, and I prayed and, and, and I got to a point where I'm, I'm like, Lord, am I saved? Am I not saved? But I would go and pray and God would take me back and I knew and I knew and I knew that Jesus had saved my soul. And some of these may face that same thing one day. And they're going to need some of us to come alongside and pray for them and encourage them and help them along the way. Because this salvation thing, you know what? We're saved and ain't nothing ever going to take that away. But it's a growing process. A growing process. And that's where the church comes in. This is the mother church. And here's the little children that Jesus has took under his wing. And said, now you're mine. And nothing's going to take you away. And it's up to the church to nurture and help them grow. Y'all agree with that? Yeah. Amen. All right. I don't know what else to do. I, I, I really don't. I thank you so much for being here. I really do. And if you haven't come and rejoiced with these already, it, you need to do that before you leave. But as far as my part's done, I'm done. God's done His work. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Ricky. Amen. Ricky, we got one more. We got one more song to sing, Ricky. Do I? I'm sorry, Jack. We got one more song. Yeah. By all means, sing it. If y'all know it, y'all can sing it with them. Be all right. Chose me. It's always been a mystery. All my life, I've been told I belong. Boy. Turns out they're the ones we were looking for all this time. I love you. Cause I'm just a nobody. Thank you for being my friend. I love to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, I gave my heart a song to sing. <laughs> He'll bring us through if we'll just let him. <laughs> Stage right. David brought a rock to a sword fight. You picked 12 outside his little body, would have chosen and he changed the world. All of the story is everybody's got a purpose. Devil starts talking to me, saying, Who do you think you are? Yeah, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody. Save my soul. Ever since you rescued me, I gave my heart a song to sing. I'm looking for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Down in history There's another blood bond Faithful member of the family If they all forget my name Yeah, that's fine with me To see nobody but Jesus. Down, down, down in history. 